get that. I had a soccer birth uh, from immigrants, uh, European Im- immigrant communities, especially German and Polish. Uh, mm-hmm. And if we could have gotten the team launched, I think it would have done pretty well. It um, has strong support of the State Youth Soccer Association. We had actually negotiated an agreement for them to be a minority owner in the team in exchange for a program that would build season tickets in with every um, uh, with, with, with the uh, membership. Uh, so it would have had a strong foundation, a good base of support, and it, it would have been great. And the plan was to build a stadium, soccer-specific stadium in uh, downtown Milwaukee on this land that had been freed up when a, a freeway spur had been taken down and use it as the uh, linchpin for a mixed-use development with commercial, residential, and retail development around it. Uh, The mayor uh, and some other civic leaders thought that was not a good use of that property and uh, refused to zone it for us. And um, funny thing, uh, you know, a decade later, there's a brand new basketball arena being built there uh, as a linchpin for a mixed right. use development with commercial, residential, and retail. Funny how that works. Yeah, it, does. it is. No, it is. But, Peter, I mean, you've helped start many teams, and I want to talk about your another team you helped start with, the Indy 11. You, you started them uh, in the NASL. What are some differences between starting a league and the top league? which was MLS and your Chicago Fire, and the lower divisions such as the Indy 11 in the NASL? Yeah, there are certainly differences between those two experiences. I think more than the difference in the size of market or the, the level of play of the divisions, I think the bigger difference is when they were started. Um, there is about a 15-year gap, and when we launched... Indy 11, the times they had changed, <laughs> uh, and for the better for soccer. Uh, the, the market was there. It, yeah. We had a, I don't want to say manufacture the market with the fire, but we had to work harder to find it. In Indianapolis, it was already there, in, specifically in the form of the Brickyard Battalion. Uh, this group of soccer fans had uh, organized in Indianapolis on Facebook and uh, created uh, a marketplace. You know, it was about 80 members, I think, by the time I was brought in to to kick the tires for the eventual owner, Saul Ozdemir. And those 80 people uh, were passionate about it. And we were smart enough or lucky enough uh, to give them the leadership in this and say, this is going to be your team. Uh, a little bit along the lines of Sons of Ben in Philadelphia. And we said, we need your help. This is going to be your team. Sports, after all, is tribal. And by connecting the Brigade Battalion, they were able to do the, the promotion, the marketing, the grassroots, uh, and along with me, the outreach to hundreds, if not thousands, of both individuals and groups that, had a passion, not just for soccer, but for Indianapolis. And we made that team resonate as a representative of Indianapolis. So whether you're a soccer fan or not, you end up supporting Indy 11 because of what it represented. And I I talk about that because that was our way of marketing and selling tickets. Uh, We didn't really have that chance as much with the Chicago Fire 15 years ago. Um, there was a group, the Barn Burners, that existed, and ultimately they became the passion uh, and the noise inside the stadium at Soldier Field along with the Polish Ultras. Uh, but as far as marketing and promoting the team, the Barn Burners did not have the effect on fire attendance. Um, in terms of the launch phase, like the Brickyard Battalion did. And we needed that in Indianapolis because we didn't have the same budgets that 
a major league soccer team had. In Chicago, you know, we had a seven-figure marketing budget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's uh, amazing. Yeah, much in uh, Indianapolis, I don't think we even had a six marketing budget. I mean, it was more like five figures. It was all grassroots. But the times had changed in terms of the audience being cultivated, um, again, because of uh, televised soccer, um, FIFA, the video game, yeah. the generation that grew up playing the sport was now watching the sport. Um, but also uh, because of the media to reach them had changed. And our um, avenue had changed. So I, I, I've always done the grassroots thing, the, you know, talk to the community and the fans. Right, right. But in Indianapolis, it was to the nth degree. You know, it was um, morning, noon, and night. We were meeting with uh, people and forming partnerships with civic, social, government, charitable, cultural organizations to partner uh, with, with Indy 11. So by the time, uh, boy, we sold 7,000 season tickets and cut off season ticket sales five months for our first game. Wow. And we did that with a, two, two ticket sales people. <laughs> they were more order takers because we had created an environment that people wanted to be part of this and they were calling, calling us. Um, so that was, really strong. And I think it reflected the success that some of the other markets in the country were having Portland, Seattle in particular, you think of that. Mm -hmm. um, some of the newer uh, MLS 2.0 clubs, uh, we did use uh, some of those, um, I guess, outreach uh, patterns in Indianapolis. So that was really a fun one. It was a real family we put together both on the field, uh, off the field, in the community. Um, something we're, anyone who worked on that project is very proud of. What do you, what do you make of the switch from NASL to USL with the uh, Indy 11? Yeah, that's a, um, a tough one. And I know Ursal struggled with the, the decision. I think it, uh, necessary. Um, I think it's, it's good for Indy 11 in the short term. I think uh, it will get them out of the drama that they've been in in the last two years because of the NASL. Mm. And frankly, that drama was exhausting for everyone involved. And it's very difficult. And I, I, I credit Indy 11 and us all for staying strong and committed to NASL as long as he could. Um, I wish there was a better alternative for him um, that would provide him with a more authentic uh, model. Uh, with NISA, we're obviously working on it, and it's coming. Unfortunately, I don't think it came enough uh, for, for Indy, uh, but there's a lot of positives for Indy and USL, specifically the rivalries with Cincinnati and Louisville and St. Louis, uh, a number of close rivals and close road trips that will ramp up uh, the passion uh, among the fans. When we talk about the NASL, it's almost hard not to talk about the lawsuit between the NASL and the USF. What do you make of what's going on uh over there, and do you think that the USSF overlooks uh, the other soccer divisions that aren't named MLS? Um, I guess there's a couple different questions in there. Uh, I, I, I feel for the NASL because I think they're, they've always been the redheaded stepchild that hasn't gotten uh, either the respect or the support of um, the federation that they desire. Um, I think they brought some of it upon themselves, I suppose. Mm. Um, it's uh, a difficult situation, and mm -hmm. um, I don't know enough about the specifics of the lawsuit or enough about law, for that matter, to predict how the suit right, will right. play out. Um, but I, I do think, to your second question, that um, there... You know, outside of MLS, and then by extension, I guess USL, um, the federation 
has not um, done everything it could to assist um, leagues and teams outside of those two mainstream structures. Uh, and again, some of it is brought upon themselves. I, I think uh, some of these independent leagues um, act independently and in a way where maybe they shun um, acceptance from the establishment. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense there, but um, one of the ideas of NISA, um, not one of the ideas, I think the core idea of NISA when it started was to give relevance to these outside independent leagues, uh, specifically NASL and NPSL, which I viewed as island leagues that had relevance in the markets they were in. But other than that, there was no relevance. There was no connection right. to anything else. And the idea of NISA, as we first proposed it to the leadership of the NASL and NPSL in, I think it was November of 2016, was to connect the two of them and promotion and relegation, um, create synergies uh, for commercial development, uh, and link, you know, give them three leagues co that would be connected and, and provide relevance. Um, that kind of fell by the wayside as the NESL uh, ran into its sanctioning troubles, and um, now we're left to pick up uh, there's some really good pieces out there uh, in NASL, in NPSL, right. in other leagues. We're working very hard to connect those, and uh, we're hopeful that before the U.S. Soccer Board meeting in February, uh, we'll have some exciting announcements to make where we'll be able to connect, uh, put those pieces together, and start filling out that vision that we've been describing, that open system pyramid mm. that can start with a third division a level and a fourth division level, and then soon add a second division level and keep the eyes on the prize down for the first division, even though it, right. it sounds so way out there. I, I do think it's, it's very possible. Uh, and create the skeleton, this model that mm -hmm. limits or eliminate barriers to entry. So it's a true open system, while at the same time uh, making ambition limitless. And if we can do that, we'll have something pretty special that will be attractive to mm -hmm. fans, players, coaches, sponsors, broadcasters, and right. investors. Now, with the creation of NISA, so this, this happened June 6, 2017. Um, are you looking to uh, compete? with MLS and USL, or is there sort of down the road hoping to combine? Yeah, I, I think it's folly to think that um, USL or MLS could uh, be part of this open system when by definition they're a closed system. Their, their ownership structure doesn't allow it. Their vision, their plan doesn't allow it. And so by that definition, the NISA alternative pyramid will be competing with them. It's a different pyramid. Um, investors, teams, coaches, players will have another choice. You know, nothing says that they in this system or that system, but there'll be another option uh, that they can uh, take advantage of. Have you had any thought into the connection with the open system with the USSF presidential candidates? Uh, well, NISA has endorsed Eric Winalda uh, because that form most closely mirrors um, uh, our vision. Uh, there's other candidates that support promotion relegation, uh, a more open system, uh, but really Eric's is the one that really closely uh, reflects what, what we're doing. And uh, we've talked quite a bit about it. I spoke on his behalf at a town hall in Chicago uh, on January 6th. 
and we feel very 